Okay, welcome back. So um, in this round of videos, I want to talk about what happens to sunlight as it interacts with our atmosphere. There are kind of like four main ways that sunlight um, can interact with the atmosphere. And you'll see in the slides that it's not just talking about sunlight. I also, in a sense, mean energy. Um, it could be, you know, heat from the sun or heat from the earth itself. Um, so keeping those things in mind, um, you can kind of use sunlight and energy interchangeably. Um, but just you can kind of, you know, think of it that way. Um, and then we will then talk about atmospheric pressure um, and circulations around um, around the world. So there are four main processes that happen to energy as it's either trying to come into or leave our atmosphere. And the first one is transmission. So it goes straight through our atmosphere. It does not interact with any of the gases or any molecules or any other particulates in the atmosphere. It just puts its blinders on and says, no, 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 no. Don't talk to me. Don't look at me. Don't, don't even breathe on me. I am out. And it just goes straight, straight through the atmosphere. Um, there's a wonderful game called Monopoly um, that uh, references, you know, you cannot pass go, you cannot collect $200, uh, you just got to go go straight to jail. <laughs> um, so that, in a way, it can maybe help you remember this idea of transmission. So sunlight goes straight in, no interactions, no, no talking to anybody, no looking at anybody, not even breathing on anybody, um, and just goes straight down to the ground and then can, can interact with the surface of the earth in, in some way, shape, form, or another. Another thing that can happen with um, incoming or outgoing energy is absorption. And we talked about this a little bit when we talked about ozone, right? How um, the ozone layer in the stratosphere, it absorbs solar energy, right? So um, the energy that is absorbed by a molecule depends on the wavelength and the radiation, or sorry, of the, excuse me, of the radiation and how well that object can absorb. Um, and a way that you can kind of, a, a really dumb analogy for that is like, you know, you see those commercials of uh, like bounty paper towels and, you know, it's like, oh, compared to the next leading brand and, you know, can absorb as well as our competitors or something like that. Um, or maybe, uh, maybe a better analogy for maybe something you've encountered in your own life is thinking about like single ply toilet paper and how absorptive that is versus two or three plied toilet paper, right? So like the, the not so good toilet paper versus the really good toilet paper and like how much more you have to use, um, in order to, to be all, all good in all working order, um, just kind of a, a silly, a silly way that you can remember, remember that one. So it depends on the material, um, of the molecule and the way that this is going to be brought up is in terms of the greenhouse effect and, uh, and climate change, which we'll talk about later on, but some particles in our atmosphere are really, really good at absorbing energy and some are not. Um, so like when we think about ozone in the stratosphere, and absorbing UV radiation. So ozone itself is a very, very, very good absorber of that wavelength, that ultraviolet wavelength, um, as it's trying to penetrate through our atmosphere. And ozone's like, no, you stay here. I'm going to absorb you. I am the really good thick toilet paper. Ah, I'm here. Um, whereas maybe um, nitrogen is like, oh no, pass on through. It's totally fine. It's just like that one ply toilet paper. It's not great. Um, or you can think of like tissue paper, like really good tissue paper. That's like nice and thick and has lotion on it. Um, like when you go to blow your nose and stuff or like the really cheap or cheaper brands of, of, um, uh, of tissue paper. And like, you know, do you have to fold it a million times in order to not get snot all over your hands or what? Um, I know really silly, maybe kind of gross analogies, but that's okay. Um, another thing that can happen to solar radiation is this idea of reflection. So it can be reflected by molecules and particulates in the atmosphere. Um, so reflection is when the energy is bounced back from a molecule at the same angle and the same intensity. So uh, the, the 
the, the value of the light has not changed at all. Um, it's just kind of reflected away, similar to like, you know, when you look at a mirror or something, that's a reflection. Um, nothing has changed about your appearance. You're just looking straight up about um, what's, you know, what does your reflection show, who you are inside, right? If you want to get Mulan about it. And then um, the next part, which is very, very similar to reflection, is this idea of scattering. So um, that's when uh, energy is forced to deviate from a straight trajectory and kind of go any, anywhere else. And what's really quite cool um, with scattering in, in our context is um, thinking about like how, um, thinking about like the, the, the molecules in our atmosphere, you know, what they're consisted of. There's a reason why I start with the composition of our atmosphere as opposed to starting with this stuff, which is what your book does. Um, but if we consider the composition of our atmosphere, what makes up the atmosphere, you know, nitrogen and oxygen and argon, and then we have those other varying components like the water vapor, CO2, methane, ozone, things like that. Um, and it's the makeup of those molecules and the chemical composition of those molecules that will allow for um, for different um, for different functions of of what happens to solar radiation. Um, so how they how they look actually has a a um, a consequence. So that brings us to this idea of Earth's energy budget. So there's a lot going on in this um, in this graph, and so I want you to take a few moments to to look at it, to study it, to kind of try to understand it. I'll, of course, I will walk us through it. Um, but what I really enjoy about this is, you know, it shows the light that's coming in and the or light and the energy that's coming in and the light and energy that's going out and the different processes that are occurring here. So like when light is coming through the surface, um, through our atmosphere, some of it's absorbed by water vapor, dust, and CO2. Some of it's absorbed by clouds or absorbed by um, water and land. So 51% of what's coming in is transmitting through the atmosphere and going straight to the land and then being absorbed by the land in this particular um, uh, schematic. Whereas a lot of it is backscattered or reflected, right? So either backscattered straight by the air, reflected by the clouds, or reflected by um, the water and land surface. Um, and that's just straight up sunlight. Um, and that's short wave radiation. So that's considering the, the electromagnetic spectrum, right? So remember that we can only see, our little human eyes can only see a very, very, very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. We have ultraviolet rays and uh, infrared rays and all the rays on, on the kind of the outskirts of all of that. So what's coming in is short wave because it's hot, right? Think about how the, the earth is, or the sun is hotter than the earth. Whereas what's leaving is called long wave radiation, and this is infrared radiation. So we can't see it with our eyes, right? Um, so the processes here is that there's net emission by water vapor or CO2 or emission by clouds, or um, there's absorption happening here by CO2, by water vapor, um, sensible heat flux and latent heat. And we kind of talked about latent heat last week. Um, so if we were to add all these things together, what's coming in is leaving. This is a whole balanced sort of, uh, of reaction and interaction here. And that's not, I mean, we're, we're not considering the idea of climate change, right? We're just considering a nice balanced earth. Um, and most of the time the earth is, um, is in this balance of so what's coming in is the same as what's leaving, um, in a, in a whole a whole uh, consideration. So something I just wanted to kind of touch on in terms of this idea of scattering, um, not so much we have like the back scattered by air here, um, but what's kind of cool is with scattering, there's, there's a reason why we see the sky is blue, right? So the light that's coming in this, uh, for all intents and purposes, this, all of this light is white from the sun and it's scattered by the molecules in our atmosphere um, it scatters that preferentially blue light. So then what we see um, of this indirect light is blue. And it's a very, very pretty blue, as long as there's nothing else in the atmosphere. 
Um, so if we had a different chemical composition of our atmosphere, then we would not see the sky as blue. Like the, the if you were to go take a field trip to Venus, um, which has a very different chemical composi composition of their atmosphere, you would see a completely different sky color. Um, or like think about when um, we have fire season and there's a lot of smoke in the sky, right? How uh, the sky is then turned a different color sometimes. If you were here for what I like to call apocalypse day or when there was that really big fire um, in Northern California and the, all of the skies in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area were like this really apocalyptic orangey red sort of color. And then we also have, you know, sunrises and sunsets, which we do see as that really similar, like orangey, reddy, yellowy color. Um, so there's a reason why we see it that way. Um, so if we look here, uh, the sun is going through just more, more atmosphere, like a, a thicker layer of atmosphere, if you will. And because of that, more of that blue light is scattered away. And then what our human eyes see are these beautiful orange, red, and yellows of the sunset. And then the, the, uh, clouds are scattering the light away as well, which can then give the impression that the, um, you know, the sky has a, a multitude of different colors. But so I encourage you next time you watch a sunrise or a sunset and it's kind of either cloudy or clear to see if you can, you know, observe these, right? So sometimes the sunsets around here are like absolutely incredible. Um, and sometimes they're just, you know, fine. <laughs> And so then this image here on the left-hand side is actually looking at a sunrise from the planet of Mars, right? So this is a sunrise, same thing that we see for sunrise, but notice how the color is just not there, right? It, Mars has very little, if any, atmosphere, and so there's little interaction with the sunlight, and so it they... If you were a little alien, a little Martian on Mars, or if you uh, pretend that you were like one of the, the fun little rovers there, then you just simply would not see the beautiful sunrises and sunsets that we see here um, on Earth, because just, just simply because of a different um, atmospheric composition. Um, so the last thing I want to touch on in terms of uh, atmospheric composition and uh, energy is through this term called albedo. So take a pause uh, if you've ever heard of the term albedo before and think about if you have what it means. So um, it is defined as how reflective an object is. So if an object is more reflective, it has a higher albedo. And it's actually, um, it, we talk about it in terms of a ratio, so it's a percentage. So how much is coming in versus how much is being reflected away. Um, so think about things on Earth that are actually pretty reflective, or maybe think about things on Earth that are really absorptive. Um, if we consider the albedo of our planet as a whole, we're only about 30% reflective. Why do we think that would be? So take a moment, perhaps take a pause, and consider why we would only be 30% reflective. And if we were to um, compare some values of some everyday materials and kind of think about those as, you know, an overall sort of, um, as a whole, we would see here that like things like fresh snow or fresh ice are extremely reflect reflective, anywhere from 80 to 95% reflective. Things like forests or crops and grasslands are only about 10 to 25% uh, reflective, so they absorb quite a bit. Grass, a little bit more reflective where it's 25 to 30%. Um, really telling things here is that the asphalt or blacktop is only 5 to 10% reflective, so they absorb really, really well. Um, if anyone has uh, um, ever walked on uh, concrete or asphalt with bare feet, you can feel how hot it is. Um, things like brick and stone also have a very, are very absorptive. Dark roofs are extremely absorptive. Um, and any sort of body of water is anywhere from 10 to 60% absorptive. And that's this value here varies very much with latitude. So it'll vary with how direct the sunlight is, basically. Is it, all, is it right on top? Can the water or the light go down further? Or is, um, is it a sharper angle and so, um, or a broader angle, excuse me, so it's, it's kind of uh, reflected away a bit more. So this kind of brings into this idea of something called the urban heat island effect. 
um, where basically during the day, building materials, concrete, asphalt, um, all these man-made items absorb a lot of energy during the day. And then at night, a lot of that energy is re 